morning. morning. Please feel free to move around if it's helpful to be able to see or hear better. So I think most people probably heard the announcement that the um, <laughs> the plumbing's gone out. Um, so of course Sunday morning right before service starts. It's a good timing. Um, but if you need to go to the restroom, you can. Just don't flush. We'll just pile on for a little bit, okay? Um, and then uh, it's the main line, so it means every, there's, no, there's no place of refuge, really. Okay? So, um, or every place is a place of refuge. So. Uh, and, uh, and, a, and a note about, about heat. You know, we have the heat on, and we'll continue to do that. The system isn't really designed to have this much air pulled out of it and keep the space warm. So I can see most of you have dressed warmly. There's always some blankets and things um, back where the cushions are stored. So always feel free to, um, to grab some of those and, and uh, keep yourself um, warm. There's some technique, not techniques in the right way, there's some kind of part of our living force that can warm you up. You can learn to get connected with as you're um, as you're sitting, especially. But then oftentimes, um, if you're listening to a talk or something, and your your concentration starts to go up to your head, then the body starts to get cold. So you can play with that a little bit, um, uh, uh, getting some warmth. And of course, everyone's um, um, embodiment is different. Some people, uh, you know, warm up quite well. Um, uh, you know, maybe just t-shirt. Um, and it feels okay, and then other people, you got, you know, like layers and layers of wool, and it still feels, feels cold, so please adjust um, uh, as is uh, needed for you. Uh, and there may be some noise as the rotor rooter guy comes as we bop along today. So, so this past week, um, uh, I was in L.A. Um, Joichi and I were uh, in L.A. for a meeting of the Association of Soto Zen Buddhists, which is one of the national organizations of this particular school of, uh, of Buddhism. Uh, the, uh, really not, I wouldn't say national organizations, um, continental organizations, so North American um, uh, organization for uh, Soto Zen Buddhism as it has flown, uh, uh, flowed through the Japanese tradition. And I always uh, love to go to these meetings because I have many uh, old friends that are there. Uh, some of you had met some of those folks that came for the mountain seat ceremony last um, month. And so this was the first time to see them since the mountain seat ceremony, which they had come to help with. So um, it's nice this year, actually, to be able to see everyone several times. And, um, uh, and it always gets me thinking a bit when we get together uh, in these groups, one of the things that we do is we study uh, the tradition, particularly as it's articulated through ritual practice. So next year is the 100th anniversary of Soto Zen in North America, which has been um, uh, the way that we came up with that 100th anniversary. is It was 100 years ago that Zen Shuji, uh, Soto Zen Mission in Los Angeles, was founded. So in 1922, uh, 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 that was the first Soto Zen temple in North America that was, uh, that was founded. And so although there were practitioners of Soto Zen before that and different kinds of things uh, happening, that was the founding of the first temple. And so we're recognizing it as the 100th anniversary. And next year, in celebration of that 100th anniversary of Zen Shuji and 100th anniversary of Soto Zen in North America, there will be uh, what's called a Jukaie, which is a a uh, very large precept ceremony where many people take or receive the precepts um, in mass. So there will be 100 people that receive the precepts there at Zen Shuji uh, next November. And so we've started the uh, study of the rituals that constitute that week-long um, uh, precept receiving uh, ceremony, and they're quite complex. Um, I have a position which requires me to know the ceremonies very well, and I've been to a couple of these Jukaye before, but I have never been in that kind of leadership position. So there's a lot of study, very meticulous, careful study of the details of how these rituals uh, are enacted. And when we practice like this and when we, uh, when we study together like this, it reminds me of our shared tradition, that we have ways of doing things we have ways of being, we have ways of understanding, of living, of conceiving, uh, of seeing, 
that constitute this particular tradition of Buddhism uh, called Soto Zen. And that that tradition has been passed down through time uh, and over space. That it has flow, flowed through uh, time and space. And that that flowing through time and space is a flowing through of people. That there have been people in relationship to each other and in relationship to this flowing of the tradition for 2,500 years since the Buddha Shakyamuni uh, lived in South Asia and taught. Uh, it's not an abstract tradition. There have been people ever since that time who have endeavored to care for the Buddha's teaching, not just as a kind of intellectual or philosophical exercise, but as a way of life, as a way of doing things, as a way of living, as a way of seeing, a way of conceiving, a way of relating. And that we are the beneficiaries of that uh, as we gather together to do the same thing that people have been doing uh, for those 2,500 years. You know, you can get really, um, it can become very tedious to study how to do something in a traditional way. You say, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Just like, couldn't we just get rid of it and then do this thing? Well, no, actually you can't. When you just get rid of it, you're just exercising your nihilistic freedom uh, karma. Like if I could just get rid of everything, I would be free. Right? And when that doesn't work, you'll turn it back on yourself. You'll see if I could just rid of, get rid of myself, then I would be free. Right? But that's not how a tradition works. A tradition works because it doesn't dispense with the particulars of life. It doesn't dispense with the difficulty of meeting each other, of seeing that relation, within relation, we carry out the deep mutuality that the Buddha was awakened to. There's much joy there, but there's also a lot of difficulty in what sometimes we feel like is constriction. So a tradition um, is there to remind us that we don't just get to exercise uh, our um, kind of willful idea about what uh, I, is spiritually important. That uh, that I stand in relationship to other beings through space and through time. And in that relationship through space and through time, there's a deep, very profound uh, message that can come to us and inform our way of being, our way of doing, our way of understanding, of living, of conceiving. And it's also true that with a tradition, it's not just something that we have already received. It's not like it just flows down and then we just receive it and now it's ours. That the roots of tradition connect and draw nourishment continuously. So in a very kind of straightforward way, that means that we don't know what we've received and there's a lot we haven't received. And that's one of the reasons I'm so dedicated to keeping a strong connection with the Japanese tradition. Um, part of my, my life has been wrapped up in that. I went to Japan the first time when I was 13 and then again when I was 15 and back in college and my wife is Japanese, my teacher is Japanese, um, we speak Japanese at home so of course I'm very wrapped up in Japanese culture but that's not the reason that I want to stay our, for our temple and the way we practice together to stay so connected to Japan. Um, it's because there's a continual receiving. We've received some. You know, you know of the sutras that have been translated into English I don't know what the percentage is, maybe 1% of the Tripitaka. I mean, I don't know, but it's like a lot. My teacher's temple, he has a full collection of the Tripitaka, which is the collection of all the Buddhist teachings through the time. And their volumes are about this big, that wide, and about that tall, and the print's tiny. I don't know, there's like hundreds of volumes. I mean, just unbelievable quantities of pages, hundreds of thousands of pages. Right? And uh, no one's read them all, you know, even the most learned, um, have, have, uh, have a little part. Right? So that's one aspect. There's lots there. 
in sutra or in the way of doing things, the way of holding uh, uh, our heart in regard to um, these important traditions. Um, but there's also all these things we can't quite see, we can't quite know, we can't quite identify. And that nourishment is continually coming through, uh, through a tradition. Now there's different ways to regard this, and the way that we regard it will have different results, uh, and different implications for um, what it means to uh, receive teaching or to practice um, in the Buddhist tradition, um, uh, or to be a community. And one of the ways, the most uh, conventional way that we think about tradition, is um, in the historical view, that there is a world and there is a history of that world, and that a tradition is a kind of march through time in one direction. The Shakyamuni Buddha lived 2,500 years ago in India. We all know where that is. Some of you have been there, but most of us have just seen it on a map. A little bit abstract, what India is for most of us, but we believe it's there. Um, we trust it's there. I'm not trying to say it's not. <laughs> I'm just saying that it's not like a, for most of us, it's not a lived experience of India. And even if you have been to India, even if you spent a lot of time there, um, it's India of the um, 21st century. Uh, and so we're talking 2,500 years ago, which we believe there was a 2,500 years ago. There's no reason for us to not think that. Um, but for us to think of it in those terms is a fairly constructed view. It's not, just, it's not just that that's how things are. It's a particular way of looking at things. That there is this world that has been there and there was a big bang and then at some point there was an earth and there was life on earth and then most of that time there were no humans and then there were humans and then mostly humans were just more like apes and then the blah, 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 blah. But until this, you know, a blink ago, there was 2,500 years ago and there was Buddha and then this time, you know, the time between now and then has come down to us. And this tradition is that people have kept um, working with the, what the Buddha taught and living it out and then it comes down through time. Now, I think this is one very important perspective. It's, it's a, it is an important perspective. It's constructed, and, but mostly when we talk in this way, we don't think it's constructed. We think we're just talking about how it is. And then all these other views are constructed. And that's one of the reasons I call it out and kind of make fun of it a little bit, is because it's so easy for us to fall into thinking that's how things are, as opposed to that's one way of looking at things. Right? And it's really one way of looking at things. It's a historical view. And it reminds us to take care of what has been cared for. If we don't do it, it disappears. So if in this generation we don't care for these ancient teachings, there's something which won't be there anymore. That's one perspective from the historical view. And so when we think about caring for a tradition, it's telling us, look back, pay attention. Don't lose these things. Help them live and nurture them so that they can flow on uh, into the future. But there are also some disadvantages to this kind of historical view. One of them is um, very popular this day, uh, th these days, I would say, is a kind of uh, viewpoint or narrative um, that's known as the secularization thesis. Some of you, if you're into um, kind of religious uh, study, you've probably heard of this before. And it's a basic understanding that came forward in the Enlightenment in the West. And that was that religion is uh, destined to uh, atrophy. That once humans have woken up to rationality, that there'll be no need for the kind of superstitious way of viewing the world that is contagious with, contained within uh, religious traditions. And so that through time, people will see that more clearly and we will secularize, right? That will no longer be underneath the yoke of um, religious tradition. Now this, this, this teaching, you know, has its place. Like humans were, have been manipulated and controlled through religious traditions for a very long time. There's a lot of power and a lot of danger and a lot of oppression that has happened through that. Um, and uh, I think the thesis goes a bit too far. It is a kind of historical view that uh, there isn't anything in a tradition 
um, except the tradition itself. It's just a way that humans have related. It's things that humans have done together, and they will wear down over time. They will change, they will wane, and then um, they will disappear. Now, the reason that the historical view um, uh, tends to go that way is because it doesn't envision what is alive in a tradition. It doesn't give uh, a shape. It doesn't give us an image. It doesn't give us a way of caring for what is actually alive in the tradition, not just the, the things of the tradition, but why those things? What is the spirit? that is in the tradition. The historical view is very easy for it to not take that into consideration. It tends to regard people as vessels of the living water of spiritual life, rather than humans as being the living water of spiritual life. Think of the difference between those things. To be a vessel, that's pretty good, okay? Knights Templar, right? Holy Grail. But actually in tradition, there's another way to regard that, that we're not a vessel. We are the flowing water, the flowing water of my life, the things I do each day, the way I am, the way I understand, the way I live, the way I conceive, the way I relate, that that itself is alive. That the tradition is not just about something which is handed down through time. It's about a living Buddha. It's about a living awakening. That the Buddha, Buddha means awakened one. That the awakened one is alive. Not just located in the past as a historical figure. Again, important. That's important. But it's not the only view. And this view, which regards the Buddha as living, has other kinds of effects. The roots in time of the historical view are one facet of this living Buddha of aliveness, of awakening, of our nature to be free. If we explore this way of thinking a bit more, or way of, of regarding a tradition, our way of doing things uh, in a tradition our way of regarding things in a tradition, are about connection. They're about mutuality. They're about intertwinement. And this is actually what it means to be alive. That our lives are not separate. That when I experience things, I'm not just experiencing objects that are out there and unrelated to me, but that everything that I regard as experience is this symphony of interdependence. The symphony of interdependence is what I regard as living. Right? And I could say, oh, here's a glass of water. And there is. There's a glass of water. It's, I'm not saying it's not here. I'm not saying I can't drink it. But that, that whole series of phenomena, all of those experiences, is a wonderful sym sym symphony, an interplay of all of us here. We're experiencing it together. Everyone from their own place. That's the flowing through that's happening all the time. It's flowing through your heart all the time. Consciousness is the flow of this living water. To be able to, to you know, we, uh, we went to this cafe. It was so nice. Um, 
there's this, you know, LA is warm, right? It was like really warm. We got there the first day, it was 80 something, you know, and um, had to take, you know, like less warm clothes. We got back here, it's like, ooh. Um, but we were, so we're sitting outside a, a cafe and having breakfast one morning and, the, um, and uh, uh, there's all these little sparrows. You know, they're living in the middle of LA. It's like concrete jungle land. It's unbelievable when you fly over it, you're just like, whoa, humans are crazy. It's just like, how can we put this much concrete down? You know, everywhere. And they are there in the middle of the city, you know, and, and we're, we're eating and the, the people stand up and they have their muffin, like it's pumpkin muffins these days, right? You know, the, the kind of fall time pumpkin muffin and couple, it's right by the, the police office. So there's a, uh, two cops are there having their coffee and, you know, BSing and eating a muffin before they're going to, you know, go out to work for one day, for the day. And, uh, and they stand up and this is the kind of place where you don't bust your own table, you know, they, they, someone will come around and get it. And all of a sudden these sparrows, I don't know, maybe eight or 12 of them. And they're dancing around on the table and they're eating all the little, um, flex of pumpkin muffin. It's like, oh my God, it's just, it's just beautiful, you know? It's like actually life is filled with that. Now, and I'm, I'm mentioning all those details because I have a tendency to kind of uh, digress in, um, in talking once we're 20 minutes in or so. But the other reason is because every one of those details is totally important. What's happening there in that moment is not an abstract thing, which we're talking about uh, just in kind of the, the wash of a brush. There's minute detail, and the closer you look, it's just filled more and more and more and more with minute detail. That's interdependence. That's love. You know, we've been sold this funny idea that love is going to like fuzz everything out. Like, f like, like love is just about the universal, and the particular is not important. But think about the things you love, the people you love. It's just the opposite of that. It's detail all the way down. It's constant attention in a world that is changing. Um, uh, and it changes because we're alive, because we're mutual. So that's what tradition is about. It's not just protecting something that got established a long time ago and we're just kind of the repositories of it and we're gonna, we're gonna protect it so that it goes down into the future. Tradition is that flow which is happening every moment of our life. Right? And it happens in relationship to teaching, to practice, to our spiritual life, as it does in all of the other facets of our life. And so when we talk about the ancestors, Talk about the ancestors of our tradition, some of them formally recognized, but um, the vast, vast majority of them's names we never will know. You know, meeting each other is meeting those ancestors. Meeting an ancestor is meeting ourselves. And this is what I meant. When I said it's not a willful endeavor, it's not just uh, me deciding what it is that I want to construct um, or what I want to protect um, or what I want to care for and then doing that through, um, through uh, the kind of will, the force of my individual being. It is the creative and free living together with ancestors. Creative and free. That's different than willful. Things that are really creative, you don't know where they spring from, right? It's not just, I decided I wanted it to be this way, so I will make it this way. There's like real deep creativity. Any kind of artistic endeavor that you're, that you're involved in. It's not just the imposition of your will upon something which allows for creativity to flow through you. It's your relinquishment of agency in the right place which allows for creativity to flow through you. That we long for that. You know? There's a deeply open space of embodiment, which just is, a, is the koan of, of life. It is the conundrum of living. That uh, the embodiment, there being encounter, there being thingness, there being meanness and you-ness and all these substances, that that is an open space. I don't need to get rid of that stuff to find an open space. 
that is spacious. You know, to meet your friend is the space for caring. If you had no friend, there would be no space for caring. It would just be a blankness. So, so we, we, we give that to each other. We're present. We are embodied for each other as a way to enact this freedom. But mostly we have it just turned on its head. Right? If I could just get away from this obligation or I could just get away from this piece, then that would be freedom. And this has real ramifications for the way we carry out a tradition. We say, oh, no, 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 that's too Japanese. I don't want to do that, it's too Japanese. Oftentimes people will, will, will feel that way. When, that's okay. I'm not saying we have to do something in the same way that people do it in Japan. But I'm saying, well, you had better meet something there rather than just dismissing it. It's not just something that's going to be imposed upon you. It's an invitation. It's like meeting a friend. You don't have to be the same as your friend, but the friend is inviting you to caring. Right? So we have the same thing within a tradition, the invitation to care by meeting the, the, the way that things are and the way that they are, are done. So, I said I'm talking about this because I went to L.A. That's true. Sometimes I'm afraid of the complexity of my own mind, and I inflict it upon you on Sunday morning. <laughs> but it's not too, too much trouble making. But there's another reason. It's because we're coming up upon the most important, uh, or one of the most important times of the year uh, within this particular tradition, which is the celebration of... Uh, Buddha Shakyamuni's awakening, which we uh, is 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 the eighth of December is the date. We we will have a ceremony in two weeks' time, which will celebrate the awakening of Buddha Shakyamuni, and then we'll begin the retreat, which is known as Rohatsu, which is the week long meditation retreat, which is a, a encounter uh, each year with the uh, Buddha's awakening, and. Um, and, uh, and so this is a tradition. This is uh, a central to uh, how we practice together um, each year. And um, there's a way in which we can just regard it as, you know, if another year has rolled around. Here we are at um, Rohatsu again. Here we are at the Buddha's awakening again. And that's fine, you know. That's a kind of historical, kind of historical way of thinking about it. Okay, now it's been 2,500 plus another year. And um, we're going to take care of this, and, and we're, move, we're moving through. We can think a bit more cyclically. We're like, well, it happens each year, and because we come back to it each year, there's something vitally important in that. There's a way of understanding in traditional cultures, particularly that, um, uh, you know, like where we sit right now, being a couple weeks, a couple weeks away from the Buddha's awakening day, that is closer to the day of the Buddha's awakening than say like a thousand years ago on July fourth. Right? A thousand years ago on July 4th is like really far away from the Buddha's awakening because, because, uh, because it's, it's just not in the right part of the cycle. There's a less linear way of thinking about time. It's a more cyclical way of thinking about time. And, uh, um, and I would say, in many ways, a wiser way of thinking about time. There's a lot of power in linear thinking about time, but it has some real restrictions. So, uh, so there's another way we can think about it. Well, we're coming around again. So this is closer to the Buddha's awakening than any other time. Because, because when we come to that day, we're right there at the same time uh, as the Buddha's awakening. We're, we're, we're right up against it. But I want to talk about this kind of third way of regarding it, which I've been um, uh, trying to touch on this morning. That this mutual arising that we call tradition, this open space of embodiment, um, that way is, is very uh, vitalizing, is that a word? Vivifying, vitalizing, invigorating, right? It brings something into our, um, uh, our way of practicing, which is, uh, which is really important. And it's about what is the quality of, the, of these roots? What is the nourishment of these roots uh, in a tradition? 
our legend tells us that the Buddha Shakyamuni, upon awakening, after sitting underneath the Bodhi tree for seven days on seeing the morning star, that the Buddha exclaimed, I, the great earth and all beings, attain to the way at the same time. I, the great earth and all beings, attain to the way at the same time. It's radical. He didn't say, I'm a Buddha now, I'll teach you how to become a Buddha. He said, every being and the great earth itself all attain to this way, attain to the awakeness, the aliveness of a Buddha at the same time. All the diversity of Buddhism, if you think about Buddhism as a tradition, as a religion, all the different ways that it is throughout time and throughout geography, is this lion's roar. Lion's roar is, is a traditional way to say like the, the, um, the, the thing that a Buddha says upon awakening. It's like a way of saying a teaching but it's like an exclamation of awakening. It's the lion's roar. So all of that diversity is this lion's roar of Shakyamuni Buddha's awakening. I, the great earth and all beings, attain to the way at the same time. It's not just that there are different ways of expressing the same truth. It's that our lives are the reverberations of the unhindered heart of awakening that is the Buddha Shakyamuni. The reverberations of the unhindered heart of awakening, that is not locked in time. That is not something that happened 2,500 years ago. That is the aliveness of this moment, of your life, of our life together, of pumpkin muffins and sparrows. And if I had to sum up, like, why is this so important to me? It's because people, we are in this together. We are in this together. These roots do not reach down to an exclusive pool that only some people uh, are privileged to have their roots in. These roots are the roots that reach to the source, which is all things. And for all the folly of humans, we forget this again and again. And yet, the teachings are still alive. The tradition isn't protected by us guarding it. The tradition is alive because we live it out. Our, our very foundation of our heart and mind is the actuality of this mutuality, of this awakening, of this flow of living water. And so I have a great confidence in the face of what looks completely <coughs> impossible. And if I was asked for a more concise summary, I would say that the wooden post, the toba, it stands in the garden. <coughs> Any questions or rebuttals?
comments. Hi. I guess my question is one wrapped up in colonization and white guilt. Mm -hmm. The being invited to a tradition that was not my direct ancestor's mm -hmm. tradition sometimes can be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I often worry about my participation in it, either lessening or altering it to a way where it, it, the, the original spirit may be lost mm -hmm. or I might be deluding myself. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what you might say about that. Yeah, um, I have a couple of thoughts. One is um, um, that uh, that that real possibility of just deluding ourselves is not um, confined to people who do not have direct ancestors um, in a biological sense within a particular tradition. So that's a constant. That's a constant of uh, of being human. Um, but but I think uh, if we look at um, uh, ways of viewing, like looking at cultural appropriation, for example. Um, uh, it's really important that we that that we get clear about those um, um, unskillful, oppressive, and destructive um, uh, karmic patterns that uh, we are inheritors of. Um, and I think there's a there are some things that we need to really pay attention to in that regard. One of them is um, when when we just want to ditch our own experience and get somewhere else, we need to watch for that. The kind of um, exotic portrayal of Eastern religions, which has been a um, pretty constant stream for several hundred years now, um, is, uh, you know, there's something romantic about it and it's brought us many things, but there's also a real, um, uh, is also wrapped up in colonialism in the way in which um, uh, Western powers uh, um, entered into South Asia and China and um, other parts of uh, Asia and then the relationship with Buddhism became very extractive and in that extractive quality of Buddhism there was a lot that was lost but there was also a lot of damage and you can see that reflected in the way that um, much of Western Buddhism has a kind of at best um, kind of regard for, uh, for um, Buddhism in the countries of its origin as being kind of quaint. And a regard that, well, we have the real Buddhism because we sit meditation or something like that. You know, most Buddhists throughout the past 2,500 years have not set meditation, by the way, if you were looking for another possibility. <laughs> um, but because we've been much of Buddhism in the West is so meditation focused that people kind of go, well, we meditate, we do the real thing. But those, you know, those those Buddhists in Japan, you know, most of them don't sit, so they're not really. They they call themselves Buddhists, but you know, that kind of like racist malarkey, like we have to get really really clear about that. And um, it sounds, you know, I'm lampooning, it, so it sounds like it's easy to see, but it's it's really embedded in the roots of Western Buddhism. There's a huge amount of uh, uh, colonial mindset and racism that is is part of our Western Buddhist tradition. So we need to mean to be very sharp from that. One of the things is one of the reasons I love to go to L.A. to Zen Shuji. Um, this temple uh, is the first Soto Zen temple in North America. You know? Most Soto Zen Buddhists in North America don't know that because their teachers don't talk about it. Their teachers don't regard the Japanese American um, community as being part of the Maha Sangha or the greater Sangha. It's not necessarily that they think they shouldn't be, but they just don't even know about them. <laughs> and so, um, so that's, there's a lot there for, for us to just make sure that the invitation is not just me grabbing something that I think I want and then, and then jetting, but staying in that constant mm -hmm. relationship. Again, that doesn't mean trying to be Japanese. And I bring up Japan over and over again because that's the direct source of our, of our tradition um, as we have it here at Budai. So, so uh, staying in, the, in that um, uh, the integrity of relationship um, 
that's what's important and that's what allows the transmission to really happen. So as we stay in, um, in a, a relationship of integrity with the tradition um, uh, in Japan, then that also reflects back into the way that um, the Dharma f uh, came from China uh, into Japan and from India into China and from the world of the Nagas into the heart of the Buddha. You know, that transmission is, is so fundamental. So those are a couple places that I really would, um, I would really point people uh, in, um, in caring for. And, and then that creative free living together with the ancestors becomes something different than, um, um, than the, the power dynamic, or has the capacity to become something different than the power dynamic of colonialism. And, um, and, and after all, Buddhism is, is, not a, um, is not an exclusive religion and is a, um, of the religions in the world, it's one of the handful that are evangelical. Like we actually go out and say, hey, you wanna be a Buddhist? That's not that common, actually. I mean, we think it's common because the, the North America is a Christian dominant place, which is a super, I mean, like it's super explicit. Like you need to make everybody Christian or you need to, everyone needs to become Christian and then this and this and this will happen. That kind of way of thinking in Christianity is really strong. But actually most religions don't regard things that way. They don't regard that they need to turn everybody over. The Buddhist version of that is most people just don't know they're Buddhist. You know? They have a lot of lives to figure it out. <laughs> I hope that responds. Hi, Joe. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about kind of a, um, a space of embodiment, or a, I don't remember exactly the yeah. words mm -hmm. you used, but it was some kind of freedom of space mm -hmm. through embodiment yeah. uh, and in the past I felt like uh, that was like very interesting to ruminate on or mm -hmm. uh, work with and um, I guess lately what I, I feel is uh, the space feels like it's uh, collapsed mm -hmm. somewhat mm -hmm. uh, like there's just like like day presses on night with no space in between mm -hmm. uh, which actually doesn't feel very uh, free. It feels rather uh, claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and then it's even like, well, the claustrophobic feeling presses so much up against the relief of overwhelmed with claustrophobia that mm -hmm. there's no even space there. Mm -hmm. And when both of those disappear, there's no space where they were. Mm -hmm. Is that, like, is there, that's very disorienting for me. Is there anything that you can say that is kind of orienting? Yeah. So um, there is a true movement that only you can make. And what I mean by that is not that you are an independent agent that will make a movement that uh, is the thing you decided to do independently of everything else. I mean quite the opposite, that actually that spaciousness, um, there are times when it feels like spaciousness, but the, the deeper truth of that spaciousness is to totally pressed up against. And when we're feeling the kind of claustrophobic side of that, um, it, it's like there's something stuck in the pipe you know, can't can't move. I'm literally, that's happening right now. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. It just came through. <laughs> um, but there is this movement, and that movement, it 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 we could. It's a lot about faith. It's a lot about trust um, in our own um, inspiration. Um, but again, not an inspiration that's just located in this outward, like this is what I want to do, so I'm going to do it. But there's a move. There's a movement there. And um, my experience has been that it usually takes getting to a place of almost just unbearable um, context. <coughs> like my life is so rich context. There's so much connection that there's no space in anything for me to actually make that movement. As long as I have like a little space, that's like, I'm going to take that, right? That's like tea in the garden. Hey, yeah. <laughs> sparrows, they're so cute. I have distance. I can kind of protect something. Um, and I can kind of chill, 
you know. But that context, as it becomes complete, I'm I'm kind of compelled for that true movement, and that's a deep that's a deep spiritual movement right there. I oftentimes think of the the um, the way that Muhammad um, uh, talked about his encounter with the with the uh, Gabriel and commanded him to recite. He said it was as if I was being crushed. You know, not that I want to be, <laughs> to be crushed, but I think about what, what is that? Or when Dogen was returning from China, he said, I felt as if a heavy burden was put upon my shoulders. Right? When I first read that, I was like, that's not what I got into this for. You know, I was for the heavy burden off <laughs> um, part. That's what I wanted. Um, but, but what I found is that both of those images remind me of that way in which the, the, the deep responsibility of a life is actually where our freedom is. That's where, and what I mean by freedom here is not just willfulness, but it's our free to respond, our capacity to respond authentically through my own, you know, through my own being. And so my encouragement to you would be to listen to that part. And, uh, and it, is overwhelm it is overwhelming, but that overwhelming is kind of um, uh, the gateway to that true movement. And one of the things that makes a true movement so difficult is there's no, there's no exterior viewpoint. No one can say, oh, Kempo, yeah, that's the right thing to do. Then it won't be your true movement. You know? It's like, it, uh, and there's, no, there's not a mirror. There's no room for there to mirror that tells me I'm doing it right or it looks good or whatever. I have to risk something in that, in that way. Um, that is, uh, um, you know, so vulnerable um, to not have have the extra p places. So. Does that is, is that resonating in some way, or it makes yeah. some sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay. We probably have time for one more. If anyone has anything. Uh, I was uh, enthralled by your uh, the image of um, the library of sutras, yeah. and and was curious as to how one's writing was allowed to be within the library of sutras. Uh, is, does it get reviewed by a committee? Does it? I mean, what happens? How does somebody? How does somebody? written word become a sutra? So there's um, in it, so kind of going a little bit technically and then, and then broadly. Uh, technically, um, what's in that collection the, of, the, of the teachings, um, kind of official, and there's a few different official ones, but the, the one that's in Japan now, um, the Japanese Tripitaka is now kind of used as the standard for East Asian Buddhism because they, there was a bunch of scholars, and they did a lot of you know work to put together. Um, but there will be two kinds of writings there. There'll be sutras and sastras, and a sutra is uh, a writing um, that is attributed to a Buddha, not necessarily Shakyamuni Buddha, but could be Shakyamuni Buddha or another another Buddha. Um, and a sastra is a writing that is attributed to an ancestor. So th those, are, those are the two big um, divisions. There are also bodies of writing that um, belong to like a, the bodies of, um, bodies of work of the precepts, um, articulating precepts and the study of precepts. And then there are some kind of philosophical writings that are like a, like a we could say, like um, explanations of how all the, uh, all the, um, teachings fit together. Um, so that's kind of broadly speaking, the different types of things that are there. So um, sutras are, um, you know, they came through the teaching of a Buddha. And um, some of those are Shakyamuni Buddha, and they have a kind of more of a historical tinge to them, that they are recorded when the, his the historical Buddha in um, South Asia, and then have protected over time. Other um, sutras, like the Prajnaparamita Sutras uh, or the Lotus Sutra, are preached by Sambhogakaya Buddha, which is a Buddha that doesn't live in the, they're not embodied in the, this realm in the conventional way that we think about being embodied. 
So those maybe in the Western context, we would talk about prophecy, for example, that there is a, there is a person who sees into that realm and then is able to receive that sutra from that Buddha and then they write it down. Um, and, uh, and that becomes a, a, a sutra. Or some of them are written down in other realms and then they're just tra they're, they're brought into this realm um, uh, through, through an ancestor in some way, but they're, con they're, they're, uh, um, they're attributed to a Buddha. And then the ancestral writings, the sastras, are um, eminent um, people throughout history who wrote um, uh, some teachings that then became the continual teaching of the, um, uh, of the tradition and people looked back to those again and again and the ones that were more um, influential uh, survived. Um, although one of the things that's really wild now is there's all these caves in Central Asia that are filled with sutras and sastras and we haven't, like scholars are just, there's hundreds of years of scholarship to open these caves and find more, and there's just more and more and more and more and more. So all of those will enter into that collection, that, you know, at some point. Um, and those are, those have, a, you know, very wide variety. Now there is some process of authentication that happens, but there's no central church that authenticates. So, um, you know, it would be a process of, uh, of scholarship and those kinds of things and in, in, in emerging consensus about what would be regarded. But there are many things in, like, some branches of the tradition that are uh, considered very, like, orthodox and other parts of the tradition are considered just, like, completely hogwash. So there's no one unified, there's one unified thing. Um, in fact, for the, for a, uh, um, uh, the traditions, the Theravadan traditions, um, like South Asian Buddhism, basically all of our Mahayana sutras are considered to be just something someone made up. Um, yeah, but we still have in that larger um, thing, we, we still have those uh, um, uh, the sutras which are used within that Theravadan Buddhism are are in the collection of the tribute. One of the things I love about it is it's just so massive that you don't get to find any edges on it, which is exactly the way that I experience Dharma. Even Dharma that seems pretty simple, like there's one sutra, the, the sutra, Prajnaparamita Sutra in one letter. The whole sutra is just one letter. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, and you just, even that letter, you can't, you can't, you can't just get it. You know, you don't just get to have the edges of it and know what it is. Um, and so for that to be reflected in the way that the collection of teachings is just edgeless, um, I think is really a, a, a beautiful thing within the Buddhist tradition. There are some schools which will pick a particular sutra and then they put all their energy behind it. So like a Pure Land Buddhism, for example, the Amida Sutra is a sutra which recounts the vow of Amida Buddha it was the Buddha of, uh, of uh, uh, complete luminosity who vowed to uh, establish a pure land in which all beings that called on um, that Buddha's vow would be reborn there um, in that pure land and then would achieve Buddhahood. Um, and so they, are, um, they put all their energy into that, that particular sutra. Um, but they don't say all the other sutras are wrong. They're just saying they are devotees of that particular um, path. And they might argue, like, what's the right way to practice? And they might be like, you Zen people are weird. Why do you meditate? That doesn't make any sense at all. Like, why would you not just call on the saving grace of uh, Amida Buddha's vow? Like, what are you thinking? Um, that, so there could be arguments about that, you know. But, um, but it's not so much like an argument for what's a valid teaching or invalid, like what's a valid sutra or invalid sutra. And there wasn't like a council that decided um, about all of those things. There have been councils throughout throughout history that have said, okay, we're gonna collect these teachings and then we'll make this collection. But they don't, it's not like uh, the Nicene Council in which that became the, the Bible um, uh, in the, quite the same way. Yeah. Okay, well let's see about unclogging things. <laughs> Charge. If you
you would like to make a donation, please visit our website at buddhaeye.org and click the donate button at the top of the page. Thanks. Sangha.